So in chapter 9, we're going to be talking about one sample hypothesis testing. To start out with, we're going to do a little bit of a review and a little bit of a transition. Okay, so suppose there's a company, Spring Valley OJ. This is actually a company from Australia. Um, they want to find a new orange juice supplier or a new orange supplier as they make orange juice. Um, their goals and their objective to get this orange supplier is to make sure that the oranges have a high juice yield. So they want the average juice yield from the supplier to be very high. They also want a large portion or a large percentage of the supply to be at full ripeness. And also because they want to maintain a brand image, they want to make sure that they have a consistent flavor. And they measure this using acidity measurements. So to make it consistent, they want to have low variability of the acidity. Okay, so how do they make sure that the supplier can provide what they need? Well, this potential orange supplier claims, just taking one of their goals, claims that their entire orchard population gives a per orange average of 5.9 ounce juice yield with a standard deviation of 2.3 ounces. Okay, so they've made a statement about population. Um, Spring Valley OJ wants to know if they're telling the truth. So they take a sample of 100 oranges, so the sample size is 100, and they're going to compute average per orange juice yield. In Chapter 7, we learned about sampling distributions. And so this question comes from that material. Given that the population described by the supplier, in other words, their orchards, um, have an average of 5.9 ounces and a standard deviation of 2.3. What is the probability that the sample of 100 oranges measures an average per orange juice yield that is less than 5.5 ounces? Okay, so think about that. You should be able to answer this question using Minitab. I'll just walk through the process. I won't go through it. But uh, first of all, we know that the mean that we're going to use for our sampling distribution is 5.9 ounces. And we've got to convert the standard deviation into the standard error of the mean. Once we have those two values in for the normal distribution in Minitab, we can plot probability that a sample of size 100 has an average juice yield of 5.5 ounces or less. How do we decide whether this is enough evidence to dispute the orange juice supplier's claim. Uh, the graph that we've drawn here, this graph is based on the distribution, the sampling distribution. Okay. The other thing, we used a sample statistic. We took an average of 100 oranges and computed the juice yield, and we used that to validate or dispute their claim. And to me, since there's only a 0.041 chance or a 4% chance that if their claim is accurate that this is what a sample would give I would think we would dispute what that claim was this is a rare event assuming that the original population was accurate the claim about it was accurate sampling distribution analysis here shows that the probability of that occurring is very low so we would disagree with the supplier and we wouldn't use them because we have evidence that potentially they were wrong about their claim. Well, this rare event principle is what we're going to use as we cover hypothesis testing. So here is an example. The claim is that a coin is fair. So that means there's a 50% chance of heads, 50% chance of tails. Um, heads turns up 27 times out of 30 tosses. That would be very rare to happen. As a result, we would reject the claim that it's a fair coin. This is the rare event rule. Another example, we're rolling a dice or a die. If the die is fair and we roll it 60 times, we should see roughly 10 of each number rolled randomly but roughly 10 and so here it's saying that it's a fair die and rolling a one happens nine times 
in 60 times. So that's around 10. That's not rare. That's what we'd expect. And so we cannot reject the claim that the die is a fair dice. Population mean example. Instead of looking at proportions, let's look at a claim about an average. Population average salary is greater than $75,000. That's a claim. We took a sample of 1,000 random salaries and we found the average was 37,000. It seems there's a disconnect between what the claim says and what is actually occurring. And so that's another rare event, so we would reject the claim because it would be rare if we assumed that 75,000 was the true average, since it's rare to get a sample like this, the original claim is probably wrong. Okay, so this is the rare event rule. Now, hypothesis testing, we're going to see claims about population parameters. In this discussion, we're going to look at means, proportions, and standard deviations. But we're also going to look at the samples and use those to make statements or analyses of the claim about the population. So we're going to look at X bar, proportion, and S. So what is a statistical hypothesis? Okay, um, It's just an assumption about a population parameter, like a claim. But uh, the first example, population mean, going back to the orchard example. Suppose they claim that the mean yield per orange in the orchard is 5.9 ounces. That's a hypothesis that we're going to want to test if we're going to use them as an orange supplier. An example from population proportion. We're going to claim that the proportion of fully ripe oranges is 85% or pi equal to 0.85. That's a hypothesis. Another one might be if we're looking at standard deviation. The standard deviation of orange acidity is 1.44 pH levels. So we've got an example of a hypothesis about a mean, hypothesis regarding a proportion, and a hypothesis regarding a standard deviation. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take these claims, we're going to translate them into a statistical problem. We're going to solve the statistical problem and then equate everything back to the original business issue. So the first step there's actually 10 steps that I'm going to walk through here, but the, the first step is deciding what the claim is. So we form the claim from the business statement. Next step, we define hypotheses, official statistical hypotheses. And now we're getting into the statistical problem. We've converted into a stats problem. Once we've got the hypotheses defined, we're going to determine the appropriate sampling distribution. Remember, in Chapter 7, we discussed sampling distribution of the mean and sampling distribution of the proportion. That's what this is referring to. In our chapter today, we're also going to talk about sampling distribution of standard deviation or variance. Next, we're going to designate the tails of the hypothesis test and give a rough sketch of the graph. We're going to choose a significance level, which is basically measuring the rareness of an event using our rare event rule and also the sample size we're going to need to choose that we're going to then quantify the rejection and non-rejection regions we're going to complete the rough graph we're going to take these quantities we've just computed and put them on the graph that we made next we're going to take the statistics so we've got a sample to validate or dispute the original claim and so we're going to get that data from a sample and we're going to compute statistics and a test statistic from that data and then we're going to analyze these results and decide whether we reject this null hypothesis that is defined above or fail to reject this null hypothesis all this middle all these middle steps are the statistical problem lastly we're going to translate what we've discovered or analyzed into a business explanation and so that's the steps that we're going to go through and if you want to write those down and walk through this that's okay I'm going to continue to refer back to these so first we form the claim from the business statement 
Now, in this case, the average number of TV sets in the U.S. in U.S. homes is equal to three. So we're going to take that statement and convert it into what happens next, which is claim mu equals three. That's the transition from business to statistics, and it's sometimes good to include claim mu equals three television sets. Um, the claim is always going to be about a population parameter, not a sample statistic. And so we want the mu, we don't want x bar. x bar is what we're going to use to analyze the claim, but we're not going to make a claim about a sample. Okay, here's an example. The mean amount of coke in cans is at least 12 ounces. So that's a statement. We convert that into a statistical statement which says claim mu greater than or equal greater than or equal to 12. Another example, the proportion of defective computers is less than 0.05. We're talking about a proportion, so we use pi in this claim. Claim pi less than 0.05. Okay, very simply we just take what's written and convert it into a brief statistical statement. Once we've got that claim, we're going to convert it or translate that into a null and alternative hypothesis. Uh, the null hypothesis is, ref is referred to as H sub 0 or HO, and the alternative hypothesis is usually referred to as H sub 1, and there's rules about these hypotheses. First rules, the null hypothesis always contains equals or greater than or equal to. Um, it, I should say it always contains equality. The alternative hypothesis does not contain equality. Now the null hypothesis, you should also note that the null hypothesis, once we're done, once we're done with all of our analysis, we can reject the null hypothesis or we can choose not to reject it. But we don't support or prove this hypothesis. Alternatively, the alternative hypothesis you may have evidence to support the alternative hypothesis or even some people use the language of proving the alternative hypothesis using statistics but we don't reject the alternative hypothesis we don't disprove the alternative hypothesis the language is tricky but there's there are rules about it um, so here's an example we're going to take this claim from before claim that mu equals three and convert it into Null and alternative hypotheses. Well, since mu is equal to 3, there's an equal sign in the claim. That's going to become the null hypothesis because null always includes equals in some way. The alternative is the opposite of the null, and it would be mu not equal to 3. And so I've now officially defined the hypotheses. In statistics, this makes sense. The only thing, as I said, that might be useful is to include the unit of measure so that if you're referring back to this you don't have to read the whole business case to understand what the mean is referring to okay so to find the null alternative hypothesis here's some examples the mean age of gamblers is greater than 30 years we first Write the claim, claim mu greater than 30. Since there is no equality in the claim, that becomes the alternative hypothesis. Mu greater than 30 is the alternative. The null hypothesis is the opposite, mu less than or equal to 30. Okay, so that's the first two steps we'll take with one of these problems. Here's an example from proportions. The proportion of defective computers is less than 0 0.05. The claim refers to the proportion, pi strictly less than 0 0.05. The alternative is strictly less than, since it does not include equality. The null is the opposite, so the null is that the proportion of defective computers is greater than or equal to 0 0.05. Okay. Lastly, we'll look at a standard deviation case. The standard deviation of the net weight of raisin bran boxes is 1.5 ounces. We claim using the population standard deviation, sigma is equal to 1.5. The alternative 
and the null are given as you'd expect. The null hypothesis is sigma equals 1.5. The alternative is sigma is not equal to 1.5. Now, once we've got our hypotheses down, we've got to take the next step, which is determine the appropriate sampling distribution. And this part is easy in theory, but when you're reading through the problem, sometimes it's difficult. But this is a very important step to understand how to do. So based on the claim and the hypotheses, we can decide whether it's a sampling distribution of the mean, of the proportion, or of the standard deviation. For the mean, it's a normal distribution when we know the population standard deviation, similar to chapter 8 when we're making confidence intervals for the mean. When we know the standard deviation, we use a Z distribution or a normal distribution. If we don't know, then we use a T distribution, which was introduced in Chapter 8 when we talked about confidence intervals. So for the mean, if we're talking about a claim that's referring to a mean, there's two possible sampling distributions that might be used when we do our hypothesis test. And this is going to be important to remember. Next, the proportion. Just like in confidence intervals, when we're doing hypothesis tests about a proportion, we're looking at normal distribution, or z-test. Lastly, standard deviation is kind of new to this chapter. It's actually from chapter 12, but it fits really nicely into chapter 9. It's a different distribution. Standard deviation, when we're analyzing claims and hypotheses from a standard deviation, we use what's called the chi-squared distribution. It looks like an x-squared test. Um, we'll see more of this later on. But that's the di different sampling distribution. So going through the examples from the past, we would know that Number two step, the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis have been defined. Take the first example, mean age of gamblers is greater than 30 years. We have not been told what the population standard deviation is. So this would be a T test or a sampling distribution of the mean using the T distribution. The next example is talking about proportion, so that would be a z-test. In the last case, since it's talking about the standard deviation, it would be chi-square. So we'd say this was a t-distribution. This is a z-distribution. And this one is a chi-square distribution. All right, and that's the, the third step is deciding what those are. And it's very easy to know that once you've defined the hypothesis. Now, the next step, once we know the sampling dis distributions, we can start to sketch a rough graph of what the distributions look like. And uh, the hypothesis tests what they look like. So this is a mean case, so we know it's a symmetric bell-shaped curve. The first example, right here, it's a two-tailed test. Think of the rare event principle. If I claim that the mean is 3, and that's all I'm claiming, I could have extreme cases over here, and I could have extreme cases over here. And both of those may be far enough away to designate as rejection regions. In, in other words, areas where the events are rare enough that we would reject this null hypothesis. The next example, you'll notice, is different. The null hypothesis is less than or equal to. This is strictly greater than. In this case, I have to think of the mean again. If my alternative is mu greater than 3, and I'm looking at this right side, it's going to be a right tail test since this is mu greater than. And the trick that I use, you'll notice that the greater than sign is pointing to the right. That's a good way to remember that I'm going to be looking at the right 
tail of this. The last case is the opposite of the previous case. Oops. Instead of looking at the right tail, our alternative focuses on less than three. So we're looking at less than three. And so if I was going to give any insider tips when we're designating the tails of the hypothesis test, the alternative is the one that points at the tails. This one is pointing both ways. This one is pointing to the right. This one is pointing to the left. So it is a lower tail test. Step five is we need to choose a significance level alpha in the sample size n. And this is looking at it from a researcher's standpoint. If I'm going to test a sample of oranges from a supplier, that can be expensive. Who pays for that? And how much value do I get if I've done the analysis correctly? So you have to be careful as you define the sample size. In this class, I will give it to you, but you remember in chapter 8, we have a way to compute sample sizes. First of all, we need to know the confidence. Recall that 1 minus alpha is the confidence. Error is the width of my confidence interval. And the standard deviation, which depends on which distribution I'm looking at, is also a part of the sample size. You probably remember this equation. Sample size is equal to my z squared, which comes from confidence, times standard deviation divided by the error squared. The standard deviation is also squared. Remember this equation. So this is the error right here, and the standard deviation is up here. So that's where we get our sample size from as a researcher. In this class, I will give that to you. But if you're going to go through a hypothesis test, you're going to need to decide on your own sample size. And this is the process that you normally use. Next, the level of significance. It defines how rare an event needs to be to reject the null hypothesis. It defines the rejection region of the sampling distribution. But the typical values, um, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.10. Um, Minitab uses as a default for alpha 0 0.05. It's the same as 95% confidence. In fact, I think Minitab uses confidence in, in place of alpha, but uh, it's the complement. Uh, as I said before, looking at this from a researcher's standpoint, we choose alpha at the beginning. We want to know how confident we want to be in our results. Um, that's a decision. This alpha decision also leads to our decision about sample size. So we really should choose alpha first. And then we can compute sample size. And then we can move on to the, to the next step. But again, as with the sample size, I will give you the alpha for this class. And the book does the same thing. Now, we want to quantify the rejection and non-rejection regions. There are two different methods. Okay, The first is a critical value approach. The critical value approach uses alpha to find critical values from the sampling distribution. Once I've got these critical values computed, they define what the rejection region is. And if you watch the basic example that uses um, a court of law as an example, um, this should tie in nicely. And the p-value approach is uh, alpha alone. That's all we need to define the rejection region. And in fact, in this class, this is going to be the preferred approach. Okay, the p-value approach. And it's actually much simpler when you're using software to use the p-value approach. Now, I still need to teach you the critical value approach, at least in theory. 
The critical values designate the limits of the rejection regions, also known as the critical regions. And they depend on the sampling distribution. So for the mean, where the sigma is known or unknown, I've got a certain type of sampling, a certain type of critical values. For the proportion, I've got some. For the standard deviation, I've got some. So for the mean, the critical values for the known case is Z crit. Since when this is known, it's the Z test or the Z interval. When the sigma is unknown, it's the T critical value. And we're going to go over this on the next slide, I think, actually. Um, but there's different critical values for each of the types of sampling distributions. This is Z, this is chi square. But I'm going to go over how to compute those next. Okay, so for the mean, when I know the standard deviation, now you have to think about where you are at this stage of the hypothesis test. You've already written down a claim, converted to null hypotheses, you know what the alpha is, you know what the sample size is, you know what the sampling distribution is. Now I just need to compute the critical value z, or multiple values if it's a two-tailed test. It's from the normal distribution. It uses standard normal parameters, and we use alpha as well as the appropriate tails to compute this. And I'm going to go through an example really quick in Minitab. The example is, suppose we do know the population standard deviation and that it's 0.58. Our claim is that the mean was 3. Since it's equality, that becomes the null. The alternative is the opposite. And I've got the alpha value and the sample size necessary to compute the critical values. Okay, so I'm going to jump to Minitab. In Minitab, you're familiar with using the probability distribution plot. To compute the critical values, you're going to want to view probabilities. And in our example, it was a normal distribution since we know the population standard deviation. We want to use the standard normal distribution, which the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. And our shaded area is going to give us the critical values. I am going to choose both tails. Why would I choose both tails? Because the alternative is not equal to. So anything extreme on either end will support this alternative hypothesis and give doubt to the null hypothesis. So that's why it's a two-tailed test, a two-tailed probability. The other thing I need is I need the probability value, which was uh, alpha 0.05. And so I'm going to put alpha 0.05 here and click OK. And you'll notice this chart, it gives me the critical values right here. Negative 1.96 and 1.96. We'll talk more about this chart later, but you've seen how to make this chart. You could also look up these values in the table in your book using the instructions in the book. <clears throat> the next case is when we don't know this, the population standard deviation. In that case, the critical value is going to be called T sub CRIT. From the T distribution is where we compute this. Instead of using uh, standard normal parameters, we're going to use a different way to describe it, which is the sample size minus 1, called the degrees of freedom. We're also going to still need to use alpha and the appropriate alpha and the appropriate tails. So here's the example. Suppose we don't know the population standard deviation. Our claim is 0.58. 
mu is less than 15 since there's no equal sign in the claim that becomes the alternative hypothesis you'll notice that this greater than or equal sign is pointing as an arrow this way so that would make it a left tail test we also know that alpha is 0 0.05 same as this case but our sample size has changed to compute the critical values now I'm going to need to remember what n is because the degrees of freedom is going to be 29 in our example since n is 30 okay so I'm going to go back to mini tab and compute the critical values Close this now I open up the same probability distribution plot instead of the normal I'm going to find the t distribution and look it just asks for the degrees of freedom I'm going to type in 29 from the example and click shaded area and in this case we need to make sure we use the correct edge of the graph in this case remember this is pointing to the left this arrow point mu less than 15 that's a left tail test the probability is 0 0.05 I can click OK and get the critical value and there it is negative 1.699 and again you can look this up in your book um, this is going to be required you uh, required of you to do on homework but Minitab does find these values much faster than the tables in the back of the book provided that you enter everything incorrectly okay so that's the example from the t-distribution next let's look at the proportion for the proportion we need to compute the critical value for the sampling distribution of the proportion it is a z it's from the normal distribution we use the same parameters as before to compute critical values u equals one sigma equals zero and we're going to need the alpha and to remember which tails are involved and so for another example problem we have the, a claim is that pi is less than or equal to 0.2 in this case it includes equality so my null hypothesis is going to be pi less than or equal to 2 because it also includes an equals term in it an inequality um, the null hypothesis is going to be the opposite of the alternative so the alternative is pi strictly greater than 0.2 alright um, on top of that we've got alpha of 0.1 n equals 50 which doesn't matter in this case because it's the normal distribution all right, now I'm going to go to mini tab to find the critical values. I want to choose the normal distribution. Because I'm looking up critical values, I don't have to change mean and standard deviation. It's just 0 and 1. The shaded area, since this is, uh, well, let's look at the which tail that we need. It's a right tail test. It's a right tail hypothesis test. So um, you note that the arrow is pointing that way so we need to choose right tail the probability is 0 0.10 in this example alpha is 0 0.10 and it's a right tail test so then I hit OK and it gives me the value of the, the and it gives me the critical value of this sampling distribution All right. Next is the standard deviation. And this one is going to introduce a probability distribution that you're not used to seeing. It's the chi-square distribution. And so the critical value is a chi-square critical value. It's from the chi-square distribution. The degrees of freedom is how we define it. So we're going to need to use n minus 1 like we did for the t distribution. We're going to use alpha along with the appropriate tails to define the critical values. In this example, the claim is that the population standard deviation is 8.7. The equality means we use null hypothesis as the claim. The alternative is the opposite. Notice our n equals 50, so that means our degrees of freedom is going to be 49. 
and our alpha is 0 0.01. Also note that this implies two-tailed testing. So we're going to need to remember that's a two-tailed test. All right, so the chi-square distribution, it uses the same menu option that we used before, probability distribution plots, and we viewed the probability. Now, in the distribution area, we want to find chi-square and plug in our degrees of freedom, which was 49. A shaded area. It was a two-tailed test, and our probability value, our alpha value was 0 0.01. Now, in, in uh, many cases, you need to divide this up on your own into two parts, but using this option with both tails, it creates two tails for you automatically and divides this probability into two, as you'll see. All right, so here's our probability distribution plot for the chi-square showing the critical values for degrees of freedom 49 and a two-tailed test where alpha is 0 0.01. So this value and this value are both one-half of 0 0.01. Critical values are 27.25 and 78.23, which is probably not something you're used to seeing, but that's okay because Minitab does it for you. Okay, so that's the chi-square. Once we've got the critical values quantified. The next step is to complete the rough graph because this is really where we start to understand what's going to happen in a hypothesis test. Okay, so here's the first two examples where we're testing the means. So here's mean and mean. I guess it doesn't say mean, but we're looking at the mean. These critical values create a cutoff for the rejection regions. Okay. And as you draw these by hand, it helps you to get a feel for what to expect when we do our analysis in step nine. Um, a two tailed example, like we have here, if we compute a sample and it's a rare, uh, if we compute a sample and want to know whether it's a rare event or not, this rejection region tells me whether it's a rare event. And so if my sample creates a value that's in this region, I reject the claim, this null hypothesis. In this case, in case number two, this is my rejection region. And if I get a statistic that falls in this region, instead of rejecting the claim, since the claim is the alternative, I would reject the null hypothesis. So really, rejection is rejecting HO, regardless of what the claim is. Okay? The next case is the same thing. We've updated our chart. We can see where the rejection region is. We're going to reject HO if our sample proportion not our claimed proportion, but our sample proportion falls within this range here. We're going to convert it into a test statistic. And the chi-square works the same way. So you should be able to find those in Minitab and answer the homework questions regarding critical values very easily. Now, the next step, we're going to collect data and compute the statistics and the test statistic. This term right here is what we're going to plot on this graph. All right? Our statistics from a sample are going to see if we've fallen into the rejection region here or here. And it works with any of the examples that we've already seen. If our test statistic falls over here, we reject HO. Similarly if it's over here since this is a two-tailed test. Okay? Now, Step eight. It's a big step, and there's some things you won't really have to do in this class because we're using Minitab. But things you should already know how to do is compute sample statistics. So we've got a claim. We know what type of test it is. We have a sample that matches with that test. Okay, so if I'm 
testing for a mean, the kind of st st the kind of statistic that I'll make or compute are going to be x bar, sample standard deviation, and sample size. I get the same statistics even if I don't know the population standard deviation. I can still compute a sample standard deviation. Okay. Similarly, if I'm testing the the, the standard if I'm testing standard deviation, I'm also going to use X bar S and N as the sample statistics, the basic sample statistics. Okay? The difference is in a proportion, instead of computing mean or standard deviation, I'm just computing the sample proportion. Okay, so from there, I'm going to convert these values into the test statistic that I just referenced. In these equations, you're welcome to study them out and learn them and do them by hand, but Minitab is just going to give us those automatically. We're just going to be given the test statistic when we run a hypothesis test in Minitab. All right, but you'll notice, for instance, when we're looking at the chi-square value, we just take our sample size, n minus 1, times the sample standard deviation squared, divided by the claimed population standard deviation squared. And that's how we compute a chi-square stat. And you remember these values from chapter 8 and chapter 7. Actually, T stat, I think, was from chapter 8 when we talked about confidence intervals. All right, so test statistics. What do they do? It's a conversion of the sample data into a format that can be read on the critical value chart that we had already drawn. And uh, it's used to convert the sample data to something that can help us decide whether it's rare or not that, that, that that's occurred. Basically, it converts it into a standard deviation measure. Okay? And so this slide just kind of talks about what, what the test statistic is for. Now, I think more useful is the p-value. And I've used the same definition for each of these because it doesn't matter which test statistic that, that you use. Once you get the p-value, it doesn't matter what you've done because the p-value makes it so simple to do a hypothesis test. And so I would say this method is preferred. And again, Minitab will give us both of these values and the statistics for free. We just have to make a decision about which test we're doing and how to interpret what comes out of the test. Okay, so let's look at p-value for a minute because I think you should know what it means before you start using it. So the p-value, it's the probability of obtaining a test statistic equal to or more extreme than the observed sample, assuming that our claim is true. So we kind of have to say, let's just pretend that our claim is true. The p-value tells us what's the probability that a sample from this claimed population would be that extreme. Okay? It's also called the observed level of significance. And you might also say that it's the smallest value of alpha for which the null hypothesis can be rejected. And uh, just a quick side note here, I'd like to draw a picture. We've already drawn the critical values, right? If I've got the critical values here and here, that means that this is the rejection region in this range right here. And I also know since I'm doing an example that's a It's a two-tailed test. Alpha is going to be divided by two and put on each side. Okay. Now, the p-value is based off of the test statistic. Okay. So the test statistic, it falls somewhere. We'll just say this one falls right here. Okay. So that's my test statistic. I already know in this example that I would reject my null hypothesis because my test statistic is in the rejection region. 
but it's important to note what the p-value is. The p-value is the area to the extreme direction from the test statistic. Okay? And so that's kind of the p-value. And in a two-tailed test, that gives me p-value divided by 2. And I would echo this on the right side to get the full p-value. Okay, so in that case, p-value would say I, I would reject HO because my p-value would be smaller than alpha. But we'll get to that in step 9. Okay, so first, step 9, we're going to analyze results and reject the null or fail to reject the null, given the analysis. The critical value approach, we already saw how to convert sample statistics into test statistics. There were those equations, or you could use Minitab. I recommend using Minitab. Also, um, we compare the test st statistic from the sample to the critical values. Okay, so what I've got down here is this just shows I've got the critical that I've got the critical values marked and their alpha values marked. So this is alpha. This is alpha over 2. This is alpha. And this is, uh, for example, the critical value that we're using in this example would be Z crit. This is uh, symmetric. Okay. So these are left tail test, two tail test, and right tail test. Okay. So how do we analyze to know using critical values, as we're talking about the critical value approach, how do we analyze? whether we reject the hypotheses or not. In this first case, if my stat value is less than the critical value, that means it would be over here. It would be in the rejection region. That's my stat. So I would reject I would reject the null hypothesis. Okay? If it's over here, I would fail to reject. If stat is over here to the right of the critical value. In the two tail example, there's two ways that I could possibly reject the null hypothesis. Either the test statistic is on the left side to the left of the lower critical value, or it's on the right side and higher than the upper critical value. So in either of those cases, I would reject H null or the null hypothesis. If, if the stat was in the middle somewhere, say if the stat was right here, I would fail to reject because it's not in either of the rejection regions. So I just compare the test statistic to the critical values. And lastly, the right tail test works the same as the left tail test. If it's uh, over here, I reject. If it's over here, I fail to reject. There were, this is the place where I reject. Okay, so that's basic critical value hypothesis testing. The next one, which I think is the preferred method, is the p-value approach. Um, the p-value approach, if you're doing it by hand, it takes more time than the than the critical value approach, which is why if you're doing this by hand, you wouldn't use the p-value approach as often. But since we're using Minitab, it can compute the p-value for us, just like it can compute the critical value. But the p-value is so clean, the way it describes the results. So we, uh, if we're doing it by hand, we have to compute the test statistic, which we just saw. From that test statistic, I can look up the p-value from a table. Or, or Minitab will just give it. And lastly, I compare the p-value with alpha. So alpha just defines the rejection region. And very simply, if the p-value is less than alpha, I reject H sub 0. If the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, I do not reject H sub 0. But this rule, this rule right here is very easy to remember. We say 
p value is low, HO must go. Okay, that's kind of the way that you learn to remember the p value rule. Okay, and how low does it have to be? That means less than alpha. So that's the p value approach. And a side note, you'll notice that uh, when we're doing two tail tests, you need to double the one tail probability of the p value to obtain the actual p, to obtain the actual p value. But we already covered that. Um, lastly, um, as we analyze, we also need to state the statistical results. So um, you've rejected the null hypothesis. How do you say that? How do you come to a conclusion? Here's an example where you do not reject the null. It says since p value is greater than alpha, there's not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. That's a statistical response. It doesn't tell me anything about the business problem or the values. It just says statistically speaking, there's a null hypothesis, and we found that we couldn't reject the null because the evidence wasn't strong enough. This next example uses the critical value approach. Since z stat is less than the z critical value in the left tail test, we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. We can support the alternative hypothesis. All this language here, and all this language here, as I said, has nothing to do with the business case, whatever, whatsoever. So we're going to need to we're going to need to convert this into a business statement. So the last step of the hypothesis test is to write the formal business implications. So you remember the process that we started out with. We translate to a statistical problem. We solve the statistical problem, and then we translate it into the business problem. And uh, so you just briefly explain what the statistical results mean for the original business situation. Okay, so that's the last step, and then you're done with hypothesis test. Now, I am going to post some example problems after these steps that I've gone through, so you can kind of see the application of what's happening, and you'll find that on Blackboard.